So Jeff is a senior lecturer in chemistry and environmental science within the School of Sciences at RMIT University. In recent years, he's coupled his expertise in the physical sciences with a passion for frogs. Who wouldn't be passionate about frogs? Quite right too. Good choice, Jeff. Um, and recently, being supervised, having supervised PhD graduates <coughs> Brendan Casey, who did a talk for us a few years ago as well, um, who who apparently gets the credit for a lot of the work that's uh, being presented tonight. Um, I won't talk much more about it because I wouldn't want to scoop anything you've got to share with us thank tonight, you. Jeff. But thank you very much for coming. We're looking forward to hearing you talk about searching for the giant burrowing frog in Gippsland. Thank you. Good, thank you. I'll say yes. I was brought up a chemist and I know a lot more about chemistry than I do about frogs. I would regard frogs as an enthusiastic amateur, um, but I, yeah, I probably am an expert in chemistry. Um, Heliopurus australiacus is a mouthful, um, and I'm just going to call it the giant burrowing frog or GBF for the purposes of this um, uh, talk. Uh, yes, Brendan Casey, a lot of this work comes out of his PhD thesis and um, yeah, he's the real frog expert. Um, what do we know about the giant burrowing frog? It's a very large, robust species. It's probably the biggest in Victoria. Um, when I told David that, he said, well, maybe the female growling grass frog is bigger, but he wasn't sure. Uh, you reckon it is the biggest, <laughs> Nick? Yeah. Uh, most of the uh, references do credit it as the biggest. Um, it's a chocolate brownie colour with warty um, spots on top, uh, rather squat uh, features. Um, various alternative names mostly connected with owl frogs, but uh, nearly everybody calls it the giant burrowing frog, even New South Wales people. Um, one question that intrigued me was, does the giant burrowing frog burrow? Um, I looked, all, all the descriptions I saw of it, except one, didn't mention this feature. Uh, I noticed Nick again nodding his head. Um, but apparently it um, burrows into leaf litter and stuff like that. But, but non-breeding. Uh, uh, both, so breeding, burrows in the breeding streams and mm. burrows for shelter out, dispersing the forest. Yeah. Um, and, and another question that intrigued me was the difference between frogs and toads. I gather there is no definitive um, biological distinction between the two. As far as I know, the only toad that Australia has is the cane toad. Um, however, the interesting thing is, if you look at that picture, and we go back to the previous, uh, no, where is it? Go back to that one. I'd say there's not a lot of difference between the two. Um, it, the GBF still has that warty um, uh, appearance on its skin and the rather uh, stock appearance. So, and it has been mistaken for the uh, cane toad. Uh, its distribution Unfortunately, this map isn't a very good one. It's not quite accurate. Uh, it was the best one I could find to put in the talk. Um, there, are two, there appear to be two distinct populations, one along the, the south coast of New South Wales, down to about Jarvis Bay, and the other one from Mallacoota into East Gippsland as far as Walhalla. Um, Uh, the records are interesting. The three um, sort of main databases, the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, iNaturalist and the Atlas of Living Australia. Victorian VBA, when I first started doing this work, up, up till about 2019 had very few records. Um, since then they've got 154, quite a few from the same person. Was Danielle Watson the lady that gave a talk to it? Yes. Yeah. Danielle um, Wallace. Wallace, sorry. Well, uh, yeah, she's got a number of reports in there in the last couple of years. Uh, I Naturalist has only got 48 and only one Victorian. Um, the Atlas of Living Australia, which people seem to think is the most authoritative one because they distill them from the other databases, have 1346 reports in New South Wales going back to 19... 
66, but only 59 Victorian. So it makes the point really that there's far more of them in New South Wales than Victoria. Uh, in Victoria, they certainly are quite a rare species. But why more sightings since 2020? Maybe the populations are increasing, or maybe people are getting more interested in uh, the frog and making more reports. We don't know. It's an expression you use a lot with the giant burrowing frog, we don't know, because there are so few observations to be able to make conclusions about them is very difficult. Um, th this is to highlight the um, differences in the species, that there's possibly two disjunct populations. Um, the type of country they're found in in New South Wales is sandstone regions around Sydney and south to Jarvis Bay, whereas um, in Victoria, south from Eden into, as I said about Walhalla. There may be genetic differences between the two populations, uh, that was reported uh, earlier, and they may have separate taxa. They may also have habitat differences. But again, as I say, uh, with so few observations, it's hard to make conclusions. Um, they haven't been found at all on cleared land. I'll say more about the sort of habitat in a minute. Um, although our recording was right on the edge of cleared paddocks. Its status is its... Um, uh, it's always been considered rare in Victoria and it's considered critically endangered at the moment and it is critical we do get an understanding of its ecology. Um, if you want to try and conserve it, you've got to know more about the frogs. Um, the known threats, as it is um, with um, uh, many of our frog species, Chytrid fungus is the, um, uh, one of the, the big culprits. Um, other things like loss of habitat and um, that are also, uh, as they are with other frog species, also are factors. <coughs> um, the, uh, as I said, the paucity of records um, imposes limits on population trends. Um, with the chytrid fungus, um, it's it, wherever you find it, um, there's always been also detected the um, uh, signifera or eastern common froglet. Um, although that they tend, we tend to detect it everywhere, so it isn't necessarily a, um, a good guide, but. We know that the um, ECF is a carrier. All the sites that we, we recorded at, there was nearly always um, uh, uh, the, the Eastern Common in the background somewhere. Um, so, you know, this may be a factor. Um, Kittred was recorded, was um, documented in a, um, a wild source species back in 2004. Um, I haven't seen many more reports of them. Um, have you seen more recent ones, Nick? Uh, yeah, I mean, so we have 160 at Melbourne Zoo, uh, Captain Collins. Yeah. Um, they came in um, in two groups. One was free of kindred, one had kindred. And we have um, observations of recently metamorphosed. So we had uh, Captain Tadpoles and then dying. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the information is known about the habitat. The northern populations generally record around perennial creeks in sandstone geology, within heathlands, woodlands, open sclerophyll forests. Um, uh, the southern sightings, the fewer they are, generally in eucalypt forests. Um, often recent recordings have actually been in non-flowing pools. Our study was on non-flowing pools. Um, was sandstone bases and mixed eucalypt forest. And this was a sort of, um, I'll mention uh, a bit later, um, Rowan Bilney's uh, survey work in Victoria. 
As I said earlier, there have been no records of observations from cleared lands. Um, probably the um, most um, authoritative and uh, most comprehensive work that was done on the um, uh, GBF, at least up till we put out our recorders in about 2018, uh, was done by Rowan Bilney. Um, he published this work in 2015 and he uh, did surveys from 2011 to 2014 in the Mitchell River catchment. So what he was, um, uh, he was originally trying to target large forest owls and he detected the um, giant burrowing frog. His surveys were mainly nocturnal and involved walking along streams listening for calls or um, putting 10 minute listening surveys near roads. Um, he did put out some SON recorders later in the study as well and he obtained 16 records from four separate streams and they, they were probably the most reliable sightings as I say up till about that um, uh, 2018, uh, 2019 time. Now, you work for two Victoria, don't you? Um, I'm on loan to them at the moment. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll probably be able to jump on me if this is all wrong, but um, Zoo, Zoo Victoria had um, big plans for the giant burrowing frog. Um, they were going to conduct these um, uh, surveys, um, establish protocols, undertake DNA survey of key streams, and um, uh, put the species onto Zoo Victoria's priority lists. Um, I think the significant thing is the um, amount of money uh, that they've invested in this. So they're obviously taking it seriously. Um, and in particular, something that Nick referred to, they um, did a captive breeding program. Um, there was a population of frogs was located in East Gippsland. I assume the student was Danielle. Yeah, uh, that would have been her. Uh, yeah, so the, we, we've collected um, twice now. So one of those was the, at the site that Danielle found mm. um, and, um, during her PhD work. And we collected the first 100, 150 odd from there, but we've now collected from a second forest block. Um, mm. So we've got different genetic material in there. So, How successful has it been? 100% survival tadpoles, 100% survival metamorphs, and we have death here. Have you been releasing them back into the wild? Uh, no, 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 no plans to release at this stage. Um, so it's a captive colony. Um, do, you stuff going on do you intend to? Well, not at this stage. So we've got, um, you know, we've got a dozen long term monitoring sites, we've got a genetic study underway, we've got you know, um, a lot of new records um, of TADS, eggs and frogs. Mm. Um, so at this stage there's, so it, it, uh, Return to the Wild will only be done once we've got genetic, the, the genetic studies. So you're really trying to study them in captivity? Well, we're not going to put them back to we've got a reason to, until we know that they're going to, uh, you know, be a force for good, basically. So mm. steps first, so we're kind of just working through that. Ah, uh, this is, um, I like this slide. This is um, Murray Littlejohn's um, entry into his logbook. I think this was back in the 80s. Um, 60s. Hmm? 60s. 60s, even further back. And I think he was quite excited to actually record it. Um, I think um, Murray used to do his recording on big reel-to-reel -reel, um, uh, tapes. And I, the story I heard was that he used to hide in the bushes and if one started calling, then he'd turn his tape recorder on. Um, considering a lot of our recordings have been done in the early hours of the morning, um, when there's been the peak calling time of some of the frogs we've been studying, um, and uh, you know, the, the number of recordings we collected in this study, it's just amazing that he was able to get as much as he did. Um,
Now, I'd like to actually play what it sounds like. This is a, um, a podcast that Murray um, did with the ABC talking about his work, and it also you'll be able to hear the, um, uh, the call. Hopefully it comes through all right. Clear, boom, 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 boom. Just a series of distinct beats and quite unmistakable. Um, one of the problems in detecting it though is it's very it's, it's a very soft call. And when you're recording frogs in the wild, I mean if you're recording signifera, um, it's deafening. <laughs> and it'll drown out e even bird noises when it's in full voice. Um, but there's so many other noises when you're doing audio recordings. Birds, uh, if you're in the city, you've got traffic noises. Um, when you're recording around dawn, you get this great chorus of birds as they wake up. Uh, and you have to try and decipher the calls amongst those, which makes um, a lot of our work quite difficult. Uh, now, our work. Um, we were, we had, the, um, in Brendan's PhD thesis, his main study area was the growling grass frog. Um, but we wanted to test out the recorders and see were they a viable method for surveying a rare and endangered species. And we looked through the literature and that, and we came across Roger, uh, not Roger, I keep thinking of him as Roger, Rowan's <laughs> paper. Um, and we got Parks Victoria interested as well, and they were prepared to put up some money for us to do a study. Um, uh, and, and so we looked at sites where Rowan had found them and um, we picked four um, uh, we picked four where recent the recent observations um, they were on the south boundary of the each, east section of the Mitchell River uh, adjacent to the Mount Alfred State it should be State Forest um, they um, the sites were um, sort of, uh, they were ponds. They did, we happened to have picked an area of low, uh, uh, reg sorry, uh, um, a time frame of low rainfall, so a couple of our ponds dried out. The other hazard we had was um, the, um, uh, the Mitchell River bushfires, but fortunately they didn't interfere with us, they were well away from where we were sampling. Um, uh, so that there were, uh, this is actually site two habitat, which is the one we actually got the positive recording from. Um, uh, and with that one, we actually used an external microphone hanging over the, um, the pond. That's just a couple of other uh, shots of the sites. There's Brendan down the bottom and his brother up the top. Um, uh, you can sort of see the nature of the ponds. Um, they mostly had vegetation overhanging them. And uh, this device here is the, um, the song meter. Um, there are recorders that you can program. And we programmed the record for 30 minutes, five times a day, starting at midnight and then two hours before sunrise, five hours, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, each uh, each recording creates a 30-minute wave audio format file of about 82 megabytes. Now, you don't have to be too um, good at arithmetic to see that that's a lot of storage. And um, we, we have gigabyte uh, SD cards, but periodically they do have to be replaced. And it also does mean that there is a lot of data collected and we have to go through, when I say we, it was mostly Brendan had to go through it all. And there is no, I'll talk more about it in a minute, there is no reliable way of plugging them into a machine, into a program, saying find me the GBS and count how many they are and show me where they are in the file. It would be if all you could do was go on to um, Frog ID and just look at single calls of species, but it doesn't happen that way. They're mixed. So we used a four-step program. We used two programs in the main, Raven Pro and Kaleidoscope Viewer. Um, 
the viewer, uh, we, we used to manually scan the program to look for potential um, signals. Um, we tried pro cluster analysis. Um, our, our conclusion was that it, for frogs anyway, it doesn't work. There's too much other extraneous noise to reliably be able to pick them. And particularly in this case, we did not want to miss any. Because they're so rare and infrequent, we did not want to miss a call. Of course, we may have missed a call in the periods when we weren't recording, but you can't record 24 hours a day. It's just the amount of data you have would be horrendous. Um, for actually batch detection, we used the program Raven, Plo, Raven Pro and Bled um, band limit energy detection, which sort of looks for a frequency box range on the bands. And that was our most successful way of doing batch processing. So, success. We did manage to um, record, the, um, uh, record the frog. And it was interesting, we had the recorders out for two years. Periodically, we have to go and replace the SD cards and the batteries. Brendan was riding up and we decided, it was in May of 2020, we decided we're just going to stop the program. So we went out there, unloaded the um, SD cards, took them home and checked them. And one hour before the end of the program, after two years of recording, we recorded our first success. Um, it was rather exciting. <laughs> um, this is um, a recording with um, the kaleidoscope, um, just the viewer. And again, that characteristic four beats. Now, I'm going to try playing the call, but it's very soft, and I'm not really sure that we'd be able to uh, pick it up. Can you hear it at the front? Yeah. I can't hear it. I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, definitely there. Oh. Yeah. If you don't, I'll, I can play it after the talk if you really. But um, I think. Um, although it's extremely faint, um, we're in no doubt that it's the same as uh, Murray's uh, calls. It's still got that boom, 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 boom. And I can show, uh, yeah, that'll be okay, thanks, Colin. We'll go back, to, we'll go back to the presentation. But we, you know, if you don't believe me that it was... No, I definitely heard it. <laughs> I just go back to where we were. It's about tw 17 or 18, I think. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah with the one with the kaleidoscope thing. That one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. that's the kaleidoscope one. Now, this one, um, this on the left was done with a program, R, there's a, UT, a program in R you can get to represent WAV files. Again, that four beats, and but that was that's that's um, Murray's uh, call from I Frog ID, and this is the uh, from a different program. This is from uh, Raven Pro with the bled analysis. Um, you can't see it very easily, but there's a box around the top of it there, which it uses for the selection of the frequencies. Um, uh, and that was, to say, our most successful tool for, and um, you know, so we're quite convinced they're the same calls. Um, there's a couple more representations. This one's a single note here, and that one's a, a seven note call. But the four note one was the, by far the most common. Now, just to finish up with, um, Brendan, since he finished his PhD, has been working on a, a project in East Gippsland. Um, the first one he was working on was involved with the Fingerboards Mineral Sands Mining Site. Um, he managed to set up recorders and detect the, the GBF. Um, 
This is an excerpt from the Minister's assessment of the, um, uh, of the um, survey work and the reports and that. And basically he's saying that um, he agrees with Brendan that he thinks that uh, his work was reliable and to that extent that they stopped the project. Uh, and he also has recently been working on uh, the rare southern toadlet, which is uh, again down in Western Port uh, and involved with sand mining. Um, he's just made a, um, uh, a submission to the Standing Advisory Committee, but he's been able to detect the southern to toadlet. And he also is successful in getting uh, tracks closed. Uh, and he used a transect of song meters within the area uh, and detected the, um, uh, the species of frog as well as the threatened powerful owl. I think there was um, this work that where they said they actually detected frogs nesting in the road. Um, which is yeah, a, bit, a bit interesting. But um, yeah, they managed to, with the, managed to get the council to close uh, the tracks off where, the, where they'd observed the southern toadlet. Um, might try um, playing, can we try playing the toadlet? Um, I don't know. That's the link to it there. Okay. Again, pretty distinctive. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's saying ribbit, actually. Hmm? I'm pretty sure it's saying ribbit. Like every good frog. Classic. <laughs> All right. Are we good? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Colin. Okay, well that's, that's about all I want to say. I think I've used about the time I intended and before your batteries run out. Um, uh, we just, I think there's one slide to finish up with. Yep, nice. Um, so I think that, um, you know, bioacoustic recording techniques of certain, we think have been successful in detecting rare cryptic species. Um, We've you know, not only been able to detect it, but to um, uh, study the nature of their call. Um, a lot of the um, acoustic features of the call we've been able to measure and study. Um, I should say, is, um, if anyone's doing any frog um, uh, survey work and wants to borrow one of the recorders, um, just get in touch with them. We've got a pile of them that we got during um, Brendan's uh, thesis. He's using some of them down in Gippsland, but I've got a few of them sitting at home. <laughs> um, but yeah, any people, are, they're fairly easy to program. Um, but um, there are a lot of work to go through the files to. I think Brendan, he got thousands of files from those, um, from the uh, East Gippsland work. And um, essentially he had to look at them all. As I say, there is no easy automated way of being able to do it if you want to be here thorough. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Thank you.